All right. Well, we're here today with Janita Thacker. Janita, thank you so much for joining uh, this video series, Bright Ideas. How, how's it going? Pretty good for a Monday. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is this is exciting. You know, when I put out my note on LinkedIn saying I was going to start this up, you actually reached out to me, and and that was pretty exciting because um, you know you never know how these things are going to go when you kind of do an all call for for talent and and people who uh, who have impressive backgrounds, and you know they're usually very busy people. So I I appreciate you coming on. Um, why don't we do this? Why don't we start out? Tell me a little bit about yourself, me and, and everybody watching, um, all 10 of us, hopefully more. Um, but yeah, give, give us some insight into who is Janita. Yeah, sure. And, and you know, I think that um, one of the reasons I reached out to you is because, you know, after 20 years in the industry, I, I just have so many nuggets that I wish I knew, you know, when I started my career. So this is really a great opportunity. So thank you again. So I actually started my career about 20 years ago in consulting. So uh, landed at Deloitte, but started at Arthur Anderson during the Enron scandal. So my quarter life crisis, you know, was a mix of you know, lots of just external crises going on <laughs> and internal crises. So I learned a lot early on. And over the last 10 years, I have been in marketing and advertising. So I made that career change in my late 20s. And now I'm giving away my age, which, you know, okay, whatever. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> whatever. So yeah, you know, uh, after a lot of reflection, you know, about 10 years into my consulting career, I decided that my true passion really was, you know, expressing my creative side, uh, less on the technical, you know, IT side, which is what I did at Deloitte and Pryor. And so right now I lead up the global corporate marketing team at World Fuel Services. So I was on the agency side. It's interesting to see things from, you know, the client side, which was a goal of mine. I finished my MBA at Kellogg. Um, just last December. So that was interesting. To Congratulations. Pandemic. Thank you. And yeah, born in India. Um, I moved to the States to Chicago when I was nine and I've been in Miami for the last 12 years. Wow. That's, that's a very interesting um, and, and diverse background. I mean, we growing up, we always heard of like a midlife crisis, right? Which happened at 50, which is interesting because, you know, not many people were living to a hundred but I guess, you know, that's nice, but yeah, quarter life crisis is an interesting thing. Um, and I, I know we, 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 in this elder millennial generation, we talk about that, but I feel like today, some of, uh, what I see is like a, uh, 80, 80, 180th year crisis. I feel like people have, have a crisis every day. So it's, <laughs> it's great to see you came through yours successfully. Uh, that's a pretty big pivot though going from agency side to client side, how, how did you like that? I mean, honestly, it was the best decision I ever made. I've never looked back and, and, you know, it was really challenging when I was in the thick of it because I went from living in France, working in France, you know, talking about global politics with my colleagues and clients to a media associate, you know, entry level position at 28, talking about Hudson oh. and like, you know, <laughs> pop culture, which was fun, you know, but it, it really, honestly, I was kind of forced into it. So I was cruising along and consulting. It was great, you know, wonderful projects. You're traveling, you're young, you're making good money. And you know, in that quarter life crisis phase of mine, uh, a few years after that, I actually just really had, you know, a level of stress I couldn't handle, you yeah. know, it was, it was just like a, almost a breaking point where I had to, I was forced to what I like to call stop, drop and roll <laughs> like <laughs> firing, like, like there's a fire away, but there was kind of a fire in my life. And so I was forced to stop, right. And assess you know, what was leading to the burnout and what it is that I liked about consulting that I wanted in my next career and what I wanted to change. And I had actually, I have a finance and marketing degree from undergrad at DePaul. 
And it's interesting because when I graduated, I did some advertising internships and I had this great interview at Publicis and I turned it down because I already had an offer at Anderson. So, you know, why, why not? Sure. So it was just one of those things where I think that we lose sight of <clears throat> in our twenties, we kind of hustle and we know that working hard pays off, but we don't take a minute to just stop drop the things that don't serve you, at least understand what doesn't serve you and then roll with what does, right? First, find out what that is and, and roll with it fearlessly. So, you know, in short, I think great decision and I'm pretty sure it's probably not my last career change, right? As I enter midlife crisis. We'll see, <laughs> you know? Yeah, you know, it's it's funny, you know, if I, I and and I wonder if if your upbringing was similar. My my parents were of the thought that you're kind of with one or two companies for like your whole career, right? And it's a very uh, boomer, ba- baby boomer generation mindset of you know you you get a job and you you know put in your dues and you you matriculate up through management if that's what you want or or not, uh, but you're there and that's it not a massive career change, not a absolute pivot from one type of career to another. I mean, maybe you go from one bank to another, maybe you go from a car company to another, but you don't go from consulting in France to entry level advertising. I mean, it's, it's when you say it like that, I guess it's kind of crazy, but it also is super healthy, right? Uh, I mean, listen, nothing we do in life is linear anymore right? The way that we live our personal lives, they're not linear, you know, women are having children later in life, you know, they're maybe going back to school, you know, later in life, like I did. Um, And we have the, the options in front of us. And sometimes it's a good thing. Sometimes it's, it's a bad thing. But I think that, again, it goes back to that key guiding principle in my career, which has been reflection. So there is no, you know, linear path that one must follow. You know, I think I went through life thinking I have to check this box and this box and this Mm -hmm. box. It's funny, Michelle Obama in her book, you know, also talks about that. Like you go through, through life, you know, checking boxes and then all of a sudden you're like, I've checked them and am I really happy? Right. Now what? Yeah. You have to ask yourself that question. And, and I, I do think that when you have, you know, that eight, you know, five plus years of experience under your belt and you decide to change careers, there are a ton of transferable skills that if you just think through them, you'll be able to outline. And you then, at least for me, accelerate in that next profession because you're not, you you can't discount that professional experience, you know, and that's, that's something that's scary at first, you know, to, to think about, oh man, it's going to take me another 10 years. (laughs) Right you know, to get to where I was. And that's not always the case. True. So, so let's talk about that. You mentioned guiding principle, right? And the reflection you actually, when we first talked, you actually told me you have a mantra or a way of living. You have three really guiding principles in your life. Um, let's, let's talk about those because I think it's, I think it's really important, important, excuse me, for our generation, as we talk to the younger generations, and also as we kind of manage up, to show that kind of clarity and thoughtfulness, mindfulness on what it means for us to be be content, be secure, be happy, whatever whatever that is, your your three guiding principles are, are pretty pretty basic, but also very very elusive. I think in the lives we we all as a society live today. Why don't you walk us through some of those, and we'll talk about them as we go. Yeah. So like I mentioned, the first one, really introspection. And I think, you know, for me, I grew up with, just like many of us, you know, a lot of challenges younger on in my personal life. And so I always journaled. I mean, it was just my outlet to, to, you know, express my emotions in a private but cathartic way. And not that I sat and said, okay, what are my values? What motivates me? But, you know, it was just a good outlet. And I think that that practice helped me throughout. However, I kind of lost sight of it, you know, in my early 20s. And for me, being forced to kind of reevaluate, you know, and when I say forced, it was just, you know, I think this topic of 
mental health and well-being and, and being reflective and self-care is much bigger than it was when I was in my or early on in my career. And so I think it's you're forced because at some point you're going to have to choose between, you know, do I sprint through my career or do I take it as a marathon? And, mm -hmm. you know, I, you know, very few people and you're lucky if you haven't had that that anxiety or that panic or that, you know, just, oh my gosh, where's my life going? And when that happens, you know, to me, it's really important to sit down, look at yourself in the mirror, be true to yourself and say, what do I want? What do I not want? What do I value? You know, what is my purpose and how do I want to leave this earth, right? What is that end goal? And it's really a marathon. So I think that's, that's been my, my biggest one. I have gotten a lot out of my network and I'm just, you know, naturally a social being right. and I love to meet people and connect with people and connect people with people uh, where they find value. So in the beginning, I think the first 10 years, I would just go and talk to whomever, right? And, and my LinkedIn network would just, you know, it would grow rapidly and I would make these connections and it wouldn't be intentional. Right. And I would connect with somebody and, you know, never reconnect. And I think Kellogg really taught me this, you know, because I think the most powerful aspect of the Kellogg education that, that I believe and most do is the, the network, but it has to be intentional and thoughtful. So yes, your network will help you. I mean, guaranteed at some point, someone in your network is going to help you with your endeavors if you right. use it thoughtfully. So now, you know, when I get a LinkedIn request or when I send one without kind of a note or telling me why are we connecting, um, I, it gives me pause. And so I think about that and I, I really think about, you know, who can I meet and connect with that I can give value to at some point and from whom I can gain value and, and keep it active, right? It's an active conversation. Sure. It's yeah, you know, and it's, it's, oh, sorry. Yeah, it's, it's so easy to just click that connect button and there's no actual requirement, right? Mm -hmm. So you have, you have all these spam and all this that like people just wanting to pitch you and it's just like, I get it, right? And that's what LinkedIn's for. It's meant to connect. It's meant to talk about business opportunities and how we can work together. And maybe you do have a product that I need or something, but I can tell you, I can't even count on two hands. I need way more. How many I get that are either absolutely unaware of what I do or are direct competitors of what I do. Oh, do you, do you need a marketing consultant? And it's like, um, no, I'm good. Like, you know, it's, that's kind of what I do a little bit, you know, and, and had it been, let's collaborate or let's talk about thought leadership or something like that very different conversation, but otherwise it's just, yeah, pass. Um, you almost know the minute you, you see it come through that you're like, well, I'm about to be pitched. Yeah. I mean, I mean, listen, just everything relates back to, it's a human to human thing, right? right. So in personal life, you want to have friends that bring something to the table, you know, without sounding selfish, like, yeah, I mean, you, you need people who add to your life in some form, right. You know, soft skills or hard skills, same with a partner, right? You're going to go through an evaluation of who you want to spend the rest of your life with. They <laughs> need to be able to bring something to the table. You know, I meet you down the street and you ask me to marry you. I'm likely going to say. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great analogy. <laughs> you know, I mean, I just think it's, it's, it's like I said, it's basic, but we forget that the things we expect in our personal interactions, you know, we forget to translate those sometimes in our professional interactions. True. Uh, I think that's important. Very true. Yeah. And I think the third, you know, for me, again, going back to balance. So we, we work really hard, you know, and I think there is no substitute to working hard, but as you get advanced in your career, you've got to, and this sounds cliche to say like work smart. Well, what does that even mean? Right. But I think it stems from, you know, Physical and mental well-being are absolute non-negotiables, right, to, to the future success of your career. If you burn out at 40, you're not going to get to maybe a C-suite position, which might be your ambition or that new right. startup, right? So, so if you don't have that, you don't have anything else. 
you know, it, and so wow. trying to make that 20 under 20 or 40 under 40 list, like that's never been my goal. Um, and so, you know, I think just practical tools that I've learned, you know, and, and I really looked to my leaders for this. So one, I'll tell you a quick story. When I was in consulting, I was really stressed out. I was prepping for this huge, you know, uh, tech demo uh, of our users in EMEA, 50 plus people. And I went to my leader and said, listen, I, I need guidance. You know, I've got this team of men. I'm young. I'm the woman trying to steer us to get ready. And there's a lot of strong personalities. What do I do? This is the Friday before the Monday demo. She said, oh, honey, you're just, you're just learning how to work with men. You'll figure it out. And well, that's super helpful. <laughs> yeah. And so, so relating that back to, you know, balance and working smart and working hard, you know, I think one is as a leader, that is your obligation to give your team the tools, especially when they're actively being sought to work smart, right? Whether it's, right. you know, <clears throat> um, certain, certain tactics, team, team dynamic tactics that might help you break through that barrier. It's, you know, organizational skills, it's delegation, you know, knowing what they're, you know, as a leader, you need to know the strengths of your team and say, you know, hey, play this up because I'm going to help support you and give you the right resources to complement your weaknesses. That's your job as a leader. Right. So, you know, I don't know if that made sense, but for me, the ultimate goal is balance. And the ultimate goal is, you know, you, you can't steam through your career and expect to achieve everything that you want um, without taking care of your physical and mental well being. And you need to do that through you know, the team you have, the leaders you have, some just practical skills in, you know, delegation and organization, knowing your strengths and weaknesses. I think those are all really important. Yeah. And let's, let's talk, let's talk about that a minute, because, you know, I think a lot of times when we say let's work smarter, not harder, people are like, well, let me find some kind of a shortcut. Let me yeah. find some program that'll do this for me. Let's automate X, Y, and Z. And sure, those are some tools that may or may not work depending where you are. But I think what's really important um, is, is that idea of delegation, right? I think there's, a, there's an assumption now, and, and you alluded to it, of, of sprinting through your career, that if you don't do everything, no one else is going to do it either A, as well as you do, or B, they're going to do it better and you're going to look bad, yeah. right? So I think what we find is a lot of people will take everything onto their shoulders mm -hmm. and to your point, that's not a smart way to work. That is almost guaranteed burnout because there's no way to do it all, right? And, and what's the point of a team being either on the team or leading the team if you can't spread the wealth, so to speak, right? Yeah, so a couple of thoughts on that. So I took a leadership class from Professor Kramer at uh, Kellogg and he has a book and he talks about level five leadership. So that's, you know, you go from one to five, what's level five leadership? At that point, it's not about being worried whether your teammate or colleague, whomever can do it better than you, if you're spreading the wealth, you want that, right? You want right. that because you know, as a leader, you, you almost want to be obsolete so they can step into that role and you can move to your next, you know, goal. So I think that fear that we have, and especially with women, you know, um, I've had great women leaders and I have had those that are really worried about, you know, someone younger coming in and replacing them. And that just doesn't serve anyone well. So I think that's a, that's a mindset, you know, and, and you, you get to that when you have more confidence, you know, in your, right. your skill set and your abilities. And when I think about work smart, I, what I really mean is resourceful, mm. you know, so it's, it's one. So you, you have this active, thoughtful network and, and you should know it well enough to know when to reach out to whom. If you have 5,000 contacts on LinkedIn, which I do, you know, I'm guilty of it because of my earlier ways <laughs> of networking. Um, you're not going to know, you know, at the tip of your fingers who might be able to help you. Right. Um, you know, I need to build this strategy and I've never done it before. And it's, 
you feel paralyzed, but if you've got someone in your network that can guide you, you'd know who to, you know, go to, or, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's, it's just being resourceful, you know, thinking through before going into execution mode about how I might do this differently. So I'm not burning the midnight oil. Right. Yeah. And I'm a firm believer too, that ideas can come from anywhere. Right. Yeah. And I think sometimes in that paralysis, while we're trying to figure out the way forward, we sometimes forget that maybe the youngest person in the room might have the answer, right? Maybe they don't know it and I don't know it, but in talking with them and, and conversely, the, the oldest person in the room or the quietest person in the room or the loudest person in the room, you know, you never know where that's going to come from. So I'm a big proponent of kind of crowdsourcing sometimes. If I'm stuck, I might go to very, very different people, you know, maybe, maybe not the person the textbook says I should go to and just kind of say, you know, what do you think, you know, and, and I find this even in my personal life with my parents, you know, my dad and I are very similar on like the headspace side. My mom and I are very similar on the heart space side. So my dad will be super analytical and tactical. And my mom will be like, well, what about the bigger picture? What do you really want to do X, Y, Z, whatever. And I, when you mesh them together, you're like, holy crap, like best of both worlds and something, not anything either one of them said, but then the mixing of them gives you the third idea that you're like, that's it. Yeah. You know, I, I, I love hearing what other people have to say because you just get different perspectives. And that's it, right? It's active listening. I think that was hard for me. It was a learning. I mean, I literally had to like look at a timer and say, okay, I'm not going to speak in this meeting for the next <laughs> like 10 minutes. Um, but I've learned and I continue to practice that. But I think the more you kind of hear and actively listen, you'll, you'll find that there's people on your team that you never thought, you know, would have something to add on that topic. And they do. And the other piece, I'm a, I have a five-year-old and she's always asking why. And I was very much, you know, again, in the effort to check off my list and get things done. And also culturally, I come from a culture where it's like, you don't question, right? You just, you know, it's, you've been told to, you know, produce this deliverable and you just go do it. <laughs> right. Then I have this like daughter who is, you know, very American and asked me why, and part of it's the age. And so I've <laughs> learned to have the courage to, to challenge and ask, you know, and say, well, why, why are we doing this? you know, help me understand because then I will actually do it better. Right. And I try to tell my team like, Hey, even if it's a small thing, like I need this document. Well, why do, why do I need it? If I tell them, then they might, you know, um, if they can't find it, ask someone else for it, you know? Right. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. I read something a while back. I'll have to find it um, and link it in the, the write-up with this video, but there's, there's a, an idea that says to get to the real point or purpose of something, you have to ask yourself or whoever, why five times? Because people, people have a hard time expressing themselves sometimes, right? It, putting some of the ideas into words, some of the feelings into words. And I think as you get to why number four, or why number five, you're like, look, it's just because X and that's your actual answer. Yeah. Right. Um, and I, and I think that that's, I learned that that's a very powerful tool, although it has to be done very tactfully, depending who you're speaking to. Otherwise, it may come across as disrespectful or challenging authority or whatever. Um, but there's a good way to do it. Yeah. And, and again, you've got to read the room. There's, there's just some, there's actually a lot of emotional intelligence right. you know, built into that. And so, you know, some conversations, some of those whys are asked in a more, you know, one-on-one -on -one setting, right? If True. it's a senior leader, you know, I think that age can kind of, you know, limit you from, from asking the why, but I think people really appreciate that. Leaders appreciate that. And honestly, you might be in a company where they don't appreciate it. And then it's not a cultural True. Way, right? Um, some companies do, you know, encourage the collaboration and really foster it. Others don't. And it just, it, you know, you've got to find that cultural fit for you. Yeah. I think, you know, and that's, that's a great segue into kind of the other, the other idea of, of culture fit, right? I mean, it's very hard as you're coming out of school or even as you're shifting careers, when you, you maybe haven't 
experienced much in a specific industry Mm -hmm. to, to know what's acceptable, right. To know what the culture should be to kind of fit yourself in. I mean, you were 28 going into the agency life where, I mean, these kids are like 21, 22, maybe 23. That had to be challenging in a different way for you. I mean, obviously you had the transferable skills, you knew what you were doing to whatever extent, but that's a different world. Yeah. Five years, six years, whatever makes a pretty big difference. Yeah. And, and I, I, I will take it back to introspection because, you know, in the beginning of your career, you might not be thinking about culture. Although I think this newer generation does really think about that. You know, mm-hmm. what is the purpose of the company? Can I stand behind it? Does it fit my values? But I certainly wasn't thinking about that in the beginning. And, um, you know, for me, I needed a culture that fostered creativity and, you know, you, you know, I never thrived in a culture that said, stay in your lane. Mm. People like it. Some people don't like that change. They kind of like to be in their domain and that's okay. But then you find a company that fosters that, or, you know, uh, fits that. When I switched into advertising, I think my biggest challenge was not so, so you know I not taking myself so seriously when these kids you know they, they, I call them kids just because they're a lot younger than me but I think it was just you know I had to kind of step back and say okay I'm not going to go into this meeting and like start with okay my my task list or what are we going to achieve like there is a different culture in terms of how you built rapport and yeah. it was very different than consulting and I had to get used to that. Um, so I didn't come off as this person with an, you know, an iron fist or very, very um, uh, rigid way of working. And, and I liked it, to be honest. I, I kind of liked that change that it brought in me. And um, the other piece, you know, I think with culture, so people think you have to kind of start with these big name companies. And I always felt like I did. And you know, obviously, and, and I keep saying that's very different for the new graduates because, right. you know, there are a lot more, you know, startups and, and that, that, that entrepreneurial environment is different now. And um, so, for example, you know, you, you might assess, you know, is a startup the right culture for you? Do you want an established company? Is it a you know, in a mid growth phase. I mean, these are just not questions we ask ourselves, you know, right. when we're starting out. And I think it's okay, it's okay to, you know, kind of learn by trial and error. Um, I know for myself that, you know, while I personally have an entrepreneurial spirit, um, I do like, you know, some if, when it comes to, you know, my nine to five, if you will, I like that. Um, the structure and the organization and the stability of a larger company. Right. If I were to do the entrepreneurial, you know, route, it would be for myself. Um, and so who knows, you know, but I think that culture is one of those elusive words that unless you experience it, feel it, do test and learn from it, um, you're not just going to nail, you know, on that first company that, that right. you start your career with. Yeah. I always, um, I always think of the first, the first job. And and of course, some people hit the jackpot or whatever in their own perspective, I guess, on, on that first job. Um, but I always think of it as like the first pancake a little bit, right? <laughs> like your first one is like, oh, this is what this is like, <laughs> you know, because well, you learn in school and, and especially, you know, I can speak from, I, I got my degree in advertising. What they teach you in ad school is not how it works. Like, you know, they, they make you well-rounded and then it's like, everything is compartmentalized. Everything is different. And so like, Oh, (laughs) Oh, this is that now, you know, and it's, it's very weird. And, and I think it's okay. I agree with you that it's okay to do trial and error, but I don't know that, well, my generation, our generation, I I don't know that that was necessarily expressed as being okay. Right. Um, And I know you talk a lot about um, giving yourself grace and then that transfers to other people. How do you, how do you kind of develop that okayness with maybe not getting it right every time? Yeah. 
That's a good question. I think becoming a mom for me really helped. This pandemic really helped. So I think it's it's more of a recent, you know, practice yeah. for me. And um, it's funny, actually, you made the pancake analogy. I made pancakes for my daughter this morning. And the <laughs> other thing about pancakes is the first one is almost never perfectly round. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. You know, you'll eat it because, you know, you're hungry for breakfast. <laughs> so it takes practice. But, you know, I, I really had to... As, as moms, you know, and even as, as just parents, even, you know, I don't think it's specific to mothers. I think it, it goes all around. You, you have to, to give yourself grace because you're going to end up disappointing somebody at any, you know, juncture, right? right. Um, like you're, in your day, at least once, I probably disappoint some person in my life. <laughs> and I had to... <laughs> I, you know, because again, there's only so much time and people say this, but it's, it's really true that, you know, um, you got to learn to be okay with that because they're going to have to do the same for you at some point, And it's a give and take. And, you know, again, going back to professor Kramer, he, Kramer, he would say, you know, as long as I do my best and I do right by others, I'm not going to regret, you know, those actions or those decisions or like, that's how you, that's how, you know, I, when I define giving yourself grace is ask yourself, did you do your best? Did you do right by others? And if it still didn't meet someone's expectation or it might've disappointed, you know, your, your spouse or your daughter or your mother, you know, your colleague, yeah. that's all you can do. And I just think that just comes with, with age. And, you know, I think life experience, um, I wish I knew that before. I wish I wasn't so hard on myself yeah. you know, uh, when I was starting out, but. Yeah, I think, I think there's definitely a balance and, and, and there's, you know, anyone watching anyone who's it's funny, right? Because anyone who's watching videos like this or who is working on being more mindful or having a higher EQ or whatever, you know, they're, they're not necessarily the ones that need to be watching these videos. Yeah. Right. And what's crazy about that is uh, I think what happens is they're almost ahead of where people and managers and leaders above them expect them to be. Mm -hmm. So I think they, they, they have a really hard time. And I was one of these people, I was always reading, trying to get to the next level, trying to get to the next level, doing everything they say you should do the proverbial they, And it hurt me more than helped me for a while because the people above me didn't know necessarily how to deal with me. I was certainly naive and cocky and learned my lessons for that to varying degrees. And I think people on this who are watching would agree that some of that it still needs work, but that's okay. I'm giving myself grace on that one. Um, but, uh, but I think it's a difficult balance for younger um people in the workforce to say, look, I, I do understand this. And maybe it goes toward an, an ageism thing of, well, you're too young to get it. You don't have the experience. And I think sometimes maybe that's a little daunting for some people, right? It's like, well, how do I get experience if, you know, you can go around and round and round. But what do you think um, is like, where do you think that kind of leads them? You know, how can they kind of be better at using the resources they do have. Yeah. So, so if, if I could rephrase you, what you're, what you're asking is, you know, when you're kind of early stage career and you're, you're, you're wanting to, you know, expand into this experience or move into that position, or you're just kind of spinning your wheels because you know, you've got to get this done or you know it, you know, you know, you have the skill set, but how do you, prove to your leadership so like how do you get past that is that yeah how do you how do you navigate it yeah yeah I honestly I am a firm believer that no one will give you something unless you do not ask so, so I I was not you know I came from a humble family you know I was not fed with a silver spoon right so you had to ask and um, it feels uncomfortable sometimes, you know, asking for things that, um, and again, a cultural role might play into this, but so 
you know, when I wanted to, when I wanted that promotion, when I wanted that raise, when I was negotiating an offer, I kind of first sat back and thought like, what is it that I really want out of this? When I walk out, um, am I going to be satisfied if I get what I'm asking for? Okay. So don't go halfway, go, go, you know, have the confidence to ask for what you want, but back it up. Right. Like why, why should I, I mean, any, any, you know, right now having, you know, managing a team now, my, my door is open, but if you come to me asking me for this opportunity or, you know, this particular experience, you know, I love that because it shows me that you're, you know, showing initiative, but tell me why, you know, right. Um, and it doesn't always have to be, well, I have X, Y, Z skills, but it could be like, Hey, you know, when I'm 50, like I want to do this and I know this experience will help me get there. And I'm like, Oh, wow. You really like have put thought into this. Um, so I think just don't be afraid to ask because no, you know, you're not going to get handed opportunities, um, without that. And I think secondly, I think you have to find at least one person in your organization that is, I won't even say mentor, but like a champion mm. it, who you can kind of first litmus test, you know, where I haven't had that I've, I've fallen flat on my face for, you know, maybe being too aggressive about my career growth plans or, um, because I'm not testing that out because there might be company dynamics, corporate dynamics, political or economical, budgetary that might be happening that you, you're not even aware of, you know, right. as a junior, junior uh, professional. So oftentimes I'm like, well, I really want to work on this project. You know, I'll put in the extra hours, raise my hand. And so I might bounce that off of, you know, a, a, a champion of mine or an advocate of mine. And they might say, you really don't want that. Hmm. No, it's going to be, you know, it's going to hurt more than help because, you know, X, Y, Z. Right. Or, Great idea. Let me seed the thought into the person spearheading that initiative. Yeah. I feel like sometimes people have, have this thing in their head. And, and I know I certainly did that. It was kind of a, um, do it on your own sort of thing, right? To ask and and you know maybe this is a cultural thing, but to ask for it was almost a little too presumptuous. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'm an overthinker as it is, but who am I to say I'm ready for this? They should just see all my great qualifications and abilities and come to me and say, hey, it's time for you to accelerate, uh, excel. Um, mm -hmm. And and that never never happened. Maybe once or twice, but never in a meaningful. Thing that to your point was at the level that I was comfortable with, right? Maybe it was, oh, you're doing great. Here's, you know, five extra minutes for lunch. And I'm using a bad example, but it was never, I want to go in and I'm okay if I come out with this, this, and this, but I'm not okay if it's not at least this. Yeah. And and I I'm 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 introspective in why, why I thought that was the case. And it's it's interesting sometimes how I think gender roles, cultural background play into employment dynamics from, from every stretch of it, from the minute you apply for the job through to the day that you retire, it's different. Mm -hmm. I don't know that it should be. I don't know that it has to be, but it is, right? Mm -hmm. And how, how is that? I mean, you've worked in male-dominated industries for sure. How, how do you find I have as well. How do you find that uh, culture, background, gender, age? How do you find that playing into to everything these days? God, that's such a big question. I know, I know, no pressure. <laughs> make, make, you know, kind of generalizations, but, you know, I think that, so, so kind of just quickly going back to asking for what you want, you know, I think at the end of the day, you know, yes, your work needs to stand alone and speak for itself. Actions do speak louder than words, but you have to, you have to market yourself. Like those actions, you know, have a loud voice, but you need to amplify that with your own kind of self-promotion, right? 
And I think that when you're younger, you just, um, you know, you, you, you don't think that that will be received well. You know, for me, a couple of things that come to mind when it came to, you know, my own cultural background and how that played out in my career or my gender. I grew up in India, you know, and, and we, we are very respectful of our elders, you know, I mean, anyone older than you is an aunt or an uncle or, you know, I mean, there's just a great level of elders, your guests, you know, we say the guest is God. So like, I had a really hard time, you know, I, I, I was an order taker for a long time, you know, when it came to how I worked with my senior leadership. And it was great because I produced, I produced great results. And that did get me, you know, that, get, that did get me, you know, far, but not far enough. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, for me, um, I mean, I think my MBA also gave me a little bit of that confidence, you know, to, you know, it gave me more of a well-rounded experience when it came to a business background, where if I was speaking to, you know, a leader in a different function than marketing, I still, you know, had the confidence to, you know, ask some, some smart questions, you know, and, right. and challenge the why. So part of it was that, um, but I just think I, I really had to get over get out of my own way when it came to, oh, well, you know, is this just how I'm culturally trained? Like this can't be, you know? And then you kind of practice it outside of your profession too. You know, I think as you get older, your, your voice does become louder because you get comfortable in your own skin and, you know, you're more self-aware and, and, and have a, a point of view, you know? Right. And, and you start to, I express it with my family, you know, and I express it with my friends and I learned to say no to social obligations. And so I think <laughs> in my own, you know, uh, you know, the more you practice that, I think it also translates in, in how you might have the confidence to challenge, you know, the norm. I think as a woman, um, I'm not going to lie. I mean, we work harder, <laughs> you know, we do have to put in the extra effort, I do believe, to prove ourselves. But I really try to find um, other female leaders, you know, that get me and, you know, that can guide me in an organization. So I'll give you a perfect example. I mean, I started at my company at World Fuel Services the day the city went on lockdown. Miami, March 16th, the city went on lockdown. It was the very first day that the company closed doors, you know, for the pandemic. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like, I don't know anybody. I'm just going to be this like little speck of sand on the ocean here. Oh, you man. Know, you know, how am I going to, how am I going to make that impact in those first 90 days? So I really had to get in, you know, I had to get on people's calendars. I think I scheduled like 50 plus meet and greets with whomever would want to meet with me at any level. And wow really helped. And I had to, um, you know, and, and then through that, I was able to find like, okay, I think the, these women, for example, like, I really think that, you know, they can guide me through a company that's in, you know, oil and gas, it's an energy, you know, management company. So very different. I mean, it's not a beauty company, right? Where you're right. advertising, where you do have a lot of female representation. So, that helped me a lot, you know, um, and I, I just raised my hand for everything. Um, and if it meant, you know, working a little bit longer, fine. But, you know, I think the flexibility we got from work from home was really, really welcome for everyone. Right. So, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's just your own conditioning, you know, and yeah. you recognize that you are conditioned in a certain way. And that's why it's coming out in, in how you, you know, behave at work the sooner you can start to undo some of that conditioning. Yeah. I mean, I, it's, it's, I agree with you. I think there's always this um, expectation of how things are right. And then the realization that you're maybe not the norm, right. You know, you grow up in this somewhat of a bubble, I guess, and to varying degrees of how the world works, so to speak. Right. And then you get out there, mom and dad are gone or grandma and grandpa are not there. Siblings are not necessarily around. And you're just like, 
all right, well, I guess I get to choose for the first time which laundry detergent I'm going to buy or what my first um, lunch is going to be. Am I going to get coffee out of the office or go to the office first, then walk with people to get coffee? Am I just going to bring it in a thermos? Whatever it is, I think you get to start making these decisions. And I think early on, you know, maybe some people, as you, as you talked about kind of coming into your own, having your own point of view, your own opinions based on your experiences that you now have. I think when a lot of people come into the workforce, they really just need a job for the income, right? Mm -hmm. And so they're in a different spot than someone who's more seasoned and is like, okay, you know, what they said in management class was true. Money is not the biggest incentive for working anymore. So, you know, maybe it, it, it changes to, I want to make an impact or I want to be in this industry because it matters to me. Um, I, I think that there's a, a very interesting kind of shift. And in sales, we talk about it as like saying no to your first deal, right? You've pitched this person and you've given the time and they're in your pipeline and you're supposed to close them. But you know that if you close them, it's going to be more trouble than it was worth. They're going to be probably your squeakiest wheel. The dollars aren't there. And you're like, you know what? Maybe this isn't the right deal, mm -hmm. right? For you or for me. Mm -hmm. And I think it happens in careers too, where you're like, you know what? I did get offered this job that I love or, or that I thought I, lo I would love or wanted. But you know what? The culture doesn't quite fit with me, right? Mm -hmm. What I have decided over these years of, my upbringing versus what's important versus what I want to put my neck on the line for mm -hmm. does not align with this. Yeah. And, I, and I, I love that concept of kind of coming into your own, right? Getting comfortable in your own skin. Saying no is a big part of that, you know? Yeah. And, and, and I think to your point, the cultural upbringing, the gender definitely plays into that. Your age definitely plays into that. Um, and I say age as in, Someone who's 40 might have something different in mind than someone who's 22. Not that it's better or worse. It's just mm -hmm. different, yeah. right? Um, and and it's, it's always interesting to see kind of how that plays out. Um, and as I, I kind of got into management, I would look at these kids, again, for lack of a better descriptor, and say, okay, that one is just like me. That one's the opposite of me. It's probably going to be way more successful than I ever will be. Um, this one needs a little work on like every level, you know, it's, it's, it's nice to be able to mentor people, I think. And, and I think that that's a big thing to give back in, in our industry and in any industry, really to your point of, um, finding that champion and then maybe even becoming that champion for someone else. Yeah. Yeah. I want to touch upon, you know, the point you made, you know, when we start our careers, it's all about, man, I just want to make really good money and get settled. And I don't think that's a bad thing. So I think, again, nope. it goes back to your values. So if you, if you value financial freedom, you know, if you, if, if that is financial stability or providing for your family is a core value of yours, then, you know, being, you know, an investment banker that works 90 hours a day to really make sure that you're going to retire by 40 or 50. That's okay. Like that's what you value. And you know, that when you get there, um, it's going to be aligned to that. If you value service, right? So if, if that's a core value that you were brought up with, then, you know, perhaps an impact driven uh, organization, you know, maybe a nonprofit, you know, maybe just, you know, giving back to your community that changing one person's life, you know, right. is, is what your goal is. So, you know, I, um, another professor I took a course with, uh, Suzanne Muchen, uh, she's phenomenal. And she would always say that, you know, purpose drives profit. And, and it just really resonated with me because I think it's really true and your purpose can be financial related. Like your purpose could be, I want to provide for my family. And, you know, after 40, I'm going to retire and I want to, you know, then do philanthropy with that money, you know, whatever that may be. Right. But I think if you do anything with a clear purpose in mind and, and you have gusto and it, it really will just help you naturally progress and, and reach, you know, whatever goals you have for your life. 
Yeah, I mean, it's so well put. It's, it's refreshing to talk to you, Janita, because you have such clarity, right? And, and I don't know if that's just the type of person that you are or if it's come with experience, but you have a way of just putting things plain as day. I talk in circles and I'm impressed that you have followed, <laughs> followed my crazy through this, this hour, but it is, it is absolutely refreshing um, to talk to someone who has it so clear and, and it's, it's aspirational. It really is. Um, it's a very high aspiration because I'm never going to get there, but I, I love it. Um, so as we wrap up, right, we've talked so much with your guiding principles. We've talked about culture, gender, impact, giving yourself grace. If you could sum it up, what advice do you have for the younger generation? So, so this this is this is something my grandmother would always say to me, right? And and this has really helped me give perspective to almost everything I do in my personal and professional life. Okay. And that's you know, at the end of the day, like when you're 20, you're not thinking about, you know, your mortality. Okay. Right. And this I don't want to get too serious, but my point is at the end of the day. You don't leave with that fancy car. You don't leave with that big house. You don't leave with any of that, right? So I think if you live your life knowing that, you know, you don't leave with that. So how do you make that one life count, right? And, and okay, even if that's what you want, the big house, like how do you give yourself the time to actually enjoy it, right? Yep. At some point. And, and I think that's really helped me. And I think I, I really encourage young people to, think about that because we often, you know, spin our wheels comparing ourselves when someone got the promotion that we didn't or the bigger house or the, the, you know, whatever, better car, you know, and I think at the end of the day, um, I really, and I'll end with what I'm listening to right now. I'm listening to Jay Shetty's Think Like a Monk and not because oh. I mean, but because I think he's just like a phenomenal person, you know, and, and it, it, it just grounds me. And so much of what he talks about is this, right, is um, living life with purpose, you know, that detachment, it, it just, these are things that we don't think about, right, young people, and we literally get into panic mode and quarter or midlife crises, you know, comparing ourselves, not just against our own, you know, lack of progress against what we expect of ourselves, but others. And, um, and that's not what you leave, you know, this world with. So. Absolutely. Yeah. That I love Jay Shetty. I've come across his stuff on Goldcast, and I'm just like, duh, but why can't you just think about on your own? Like, why does it have to be some guy through, through a computer that has to say it? You know, it's, you know, you know it, but you need that sometimes yeah. you hear it reinforced, you know, and, and I, I, you know, I hope this whole thing doesn't sound very fluffy and, you know, um, you know, soft, but I, I, I think those things are important, you know, and I just don't yeah. think about them enough. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, you know, I realized this the other day, I was getting so in my head about something that was so not important and had nothing to do with anyone else. But I was just playing in my head, in my head, in my head, I'm like, calm down. No, what are you even comparing it to? Because how many times do we go down a rabbit hole and we're comparing ourselves to nothing, to a situation that hasn't happened, to yeah. something that doesn't exist? And you're just like, where did this come from? And if, but if you go back to the basics, right, you can't take it with you, live with purpose, enjoy your life. Yeah. Like the end game is six feet in the ground, right? I mean, <laughs> what are we rushing for? You know, I mean, maybe there's redemption, who knows, whatever religious beliefs you fine, but still like chill out. Like you'll get there. We promise no one's living yeah. forever. Yeah. You know, even if that is it, but it, it, it is so important. I don't think it's fluffy at all. Um, I think, I think people need to hear it from different sets of people because, you know, when your mom said it, it wasn't true. But when, you know, some stranger you've never met in your life says it, you're like, oh my God, what a revelation. It's like your mom's sitting here, like cursing you under her breath a little bit. Who takes advice from their mother anyway, right? I know. <laughs> what is this craziness? 
Anyway, all right. So this has been an uh, awesome. We're going to wrap it up with five rapid fire questions, not meant to be big thinkers. Um, so easy, related, not related, whatever. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Hundred percent. What is your current passion project? Uh, writing. Oh, trying to publish a book. Yep. Love it. I love that. I think you should do it. What is your dream vacation? Um. Oh my God. Like so many, that's like the hardest question. I don't know. Just you can get on a plane tonight for free. Where are you going? South Africa. There you go. Go to comfort food. Indian food. Anything like, specific? Mom's, mom's uh, I'm from Gujarat. So we have this porridge rice dish called kichdi. Okay. And it's just so comforting. Anytime I travel and I come home, like that's the first thing I want to make. And it's super easy. So yeah. And you make it or it's got to be your mom's? Oh, I make it. Oh, good. I, think I make it better than my mom, but don't oh. let her hear me say that. <laughs> I'm not editing. I'm not editing these videos. So you're going to have to see the wrath for that I'm one. I'm proud. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then finally, um, oh, I realized I just only wrote four. Um, how do you take your coffee? Oh gosh. Almond milk and, you know, sugar. I'm sorry, but sugar is necessary. Whoever says cut out sugar. It's so bad for you is no not living life to its fullest. Enjoy your life, right? There we go. <laughs> if you want sugar, eat the sugar. All right. Well, thank you for this. This has been fantastic. Um, this is going out on a lot of different social channels. So is there anything that you're working on? Are you hiring? Are you working on something where you're looking for collaborators? Why should people connect with you? Why should they make this thoughtful connection with you? Yeah. So again, you know, talk to me about sustainability. That's a big thing I'm working on. If you if you're an expert in the field, if you know you want to work in that uh, space, especially with well fuel and you know us being an energy management company, that's a big focus. Talk to me about uh, mental health and wellness and and well being. Um, you know, I am involved with. In, quite a few nonprofits, including This Is My Brave, which I recently got involved with, and I'm producing a show for them in next oh, fall. Uh, very cool. In the works, but um, it will be around bringing awareness and removing stigma around mental health in the um, local South Florida community. So love that. Love yeah. that. Um, yeah. And just, just, you know, any other help or guidance just from the nuggets you guys hopefully have picked up from this conversation. I'm happy to talk further to you with you about it. Fantastic. I'm so excited to get this out to, to the ether and whoever is going to watch it. I, I think this is such important information and advice. So again, thank you so much for taking the time out. I know you're slammed. So I think this is really, um, really noble. I, I love it. So with that said, thank you, Janita Thacker, for your time. And, um, you know, put your comments below and don't hesitate to subscribe and come to the next Bright Ideas installment. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.